G'day guys, we'll get started, 10 minutes on the clock. All right, for those watching the video, I've got a bit of a different background than usual down the south coast and really looking forward to um, getting out for my run, just about to go after recording this. So today we're gonna to be talking about um, the micro-loading side of things. We touched briefly on macro-loading, so that's the idea of uh, programming principles and what other um, stresses you have throughout your uh, week that might be impacting your running, and, and we'll definitely go a bit deeper into that um, uh, soon, but I thought it would be best to talk about micro-loading now. So it's this idea of running technique and it, things that will influence um, your running technique, because it's something that um, a lot of people, like some people who never think about it, and they'll just run the same way that they've always run and think that's the only way to do it. Um, but then there are other people who go down deep down the rabbit hole of running technique and uh, that has its own um, uh, challenges as well. And I've, I'm someone who um, I originally just ran how I always ran and I thought I was pretty good and then realized when I started tearing my hamstrings quite often when I was uh, playing sport, um, whenever I tried to sprint, that there was maybe some different things you could do which would um, lead to a whole lot less injury. So I ended up working with a running uh, coach who's pretty involved in Australian um, sport and yeah, it was just an amazing thing to realize that, you know, you don't just have to run your default way. There's lots of little variables um, that you can tweak that will have quite a big impact on how you feel when you're running. Now, when it comes to running technique, there's sort of been a lot of research into whether or not it improves um, performance and improves um, injury prevention. And the idea, like, I guess the big thing that people often think about with running technique is the type of uh, foot strike you do. So whether that's a heel strike, um, a midfoot strike or a forefoot strike. And there's been a whole bunch of research into that, but um, one of the big takeaways with, um, with running technique is that it's so individual about what is the most efficient way for a person to run that you can't just follow a, a guide of looking, you know, trying to look as symmetrical and as, um, I guess everyone trying to run like Elliot Kipchoge, the guy who ran the um, sub two hour non-official marathon. Um, because yeah, there's just so much individual variation in what is the highest running efficiency for a person and their, with their technique. So I guess the best example of this is um, if you've followed marathon running with, uh, for a while, or if you even just one of the most famous names in marathon running is, um, is Paula Radcliffe, who held the women's marathon world record for 17 years, recently broken. Um, and if it was when she first started running at university, they, they took her VO2 max. So it's a bit, we talked about yesterday, which is basically how much oxygen um, can she process at a time. And so that's going to come down to your how much blood you're pumping from your heart and then how much um, uh, machinery you have around your body to utilize that oxygen. Um, and that VO2 max number is something that a lot of people chase to go up. And then we also talked about the idea of running efficiency, which is basically how far and fast you can go per given unit of oxygen that you're burning. So if you have a high VO2 max, but low running efficiency, um, that's your basically like a huge tank, but not able to utilize it. Um, and it's often the case that people who have, because VO2 max is very much a genetic, um, I mean, it is something that you can train, but there's a, a big genetic factor. So basically um, the different people will just have different ceilings and, and um, for how high they can get their VO2 max. So if someone naturally has a high VO2 max, it's quite common that they um, have a pretty low running efficiency because they just haven't needed to <laughs> improve it. And it is something that you can train. But a good example, yeah, with Paula Radcliffe was basically when she started university, they looked at her VO2 max and her running efficiency at when she first started running. <laughs> and then they were tracking her basically um, every year as she um, developed into the runner that um, eventually ran the um, fastest ever women's um, marathon. And what was really interesting was that um, she kind of peaked out at her VO2 max pretty quickly, like from basically when she first started university, she'd done enough training that she'd reached her genetic potential with that. But as she ran more and more and, um, you know, did all the things that a professional um, or sub like professional runner um, would do with strength training and uh, running coaching, her running efficiency just got better and better and better um, until the point where Although she was still, her VO2 max was the same. So she was still, um, I guess, producing the same amount of, um, like she still had the same amount of fuel, but she was just utilizing it that much better. 
which led to her becoming one of the best runners, well, the best runner at, at the time. Now, all of this is, you know, that sounds fair enough, um, you know, pretty normal for a runner to, to do that. But I, I urge you to look on YouTube and watch Paula Radcliffe run because it is not what you'd call kind of perfect running technique. It's not what you'd sort of associate with being this like, um, you know, gazelle-like uh, amazing runner um, who looks perfectly symmetrical and looks like, you know, what a textbook would suggest that running should look like. Her head sort of bobs to the side and every step, um, she's got some weird twisting sort of actions and it looks like this kind of, I don't know, it just looks, it's painful to watch. Um, but it, there's like the data to show and the results to show that this running technique um, was what was most efficient for her. So that's not to say that you should try and, um, you know, I guess, try and do the same technique as Paula Radcliffe. I certainly would not suggest that. But what I am saying is that, that basically there's, it, you, you can strive towards a, a perfect looking run style, um, but that's not necessarily what's gonna be um, the best for you. So I think where running technique becomes um, quite useful, and, and in the clinic I, I do running technique um, analysis, I have some foot pods that just give you so much information, probably too much information. Um, if you have a Garmin watch or um, certain heart straps or foot pods, they also give you um, a, a decent amount of information. But there's where running technique becomes really useful is basically understanding what variables you can change. Because as I said, when I first started running, I sort of hadn't really considered um, how you could change the technique. And, and I, I remember my, my sprint coach sort of saying, like, when you try and sprint, you don't run any faster, you just scrunch your face up more. So I didn't really have like, the levers to pull, I guess, on um, different ways of running. So where running um, technique is, is useful is basically you can see, hey, how does it feel when I um, try and land with, you know, the foot more underneath my body versus out in, f so that would be kind of your more midfoot um, or forefoot strike versus kind of out in front. Uh, what does it feel like when I, um, you know, bend my elbows a little bit more and um, move my arms uh, a bit quicker and, um, yeah, having these different ways of uh, changing your running technique will just start to give you a feeling of, of basically what it what is most comfortable uh, for you. And it's sometimes useful to try and over-exaggerate these things to because <laughs> if you feel like you're doing it a little, like with running technique, and I noticed this when I was uh, training a lot for swimming, like you'd often change something a little bit, uh, which would feel like a lot to you, but really wouldn't be much of a, a change. So I, I do suggest um, getting out there give me a go, maybe looking a bit silly, but seeing what it feels like, and, and maybe I'll just pause here and start to talk about some of the things you can change. So one of the biggest things in um, running technique is cadence. And so cadence is basically how many steps per minute you're taking. So like for myself, my natural sort of cadence is probably about 155. Like it seems to be around that, like kind of 150, maybe to 160. Um, sometimes a bit slower, like I'm a slow lopey sort of runner. So generally I'll take quite large steps, but I'll take them slowly. Now, um, basically all of the advice that suggests the best way to run is um, to try and really, you have cadence quite high and make your steps smaller. The reasons for that is basically if you can, um, if you think about large, long lopey steps, you're basically going to have quite high impact forces you're going to have um, fairly high, uh, like, yeah, impact, uh, high range of motion, and each sort of muscular effort is going to be higher on your sort of threshold of muscular effort. So that means basically it's like lifting a heavier weight. Um, and when you lift a heavier weight, you can um, lift it fewer times. So if you try and increase your uh, running cadence, so basically um, stepping a bit faster, shorter sort of steps, it means that each of those individual steps is going to be less of a stress and therefore you can do many more reps before you start to exceed that threshold and run into um, challenges. So there's sort of like the 180 steps per minute um, was kind of this uh, number that was thrown around a lot as the like ideal um, running cadence and you know you can look on um, Spotify or, or YouTube and there's like infinite playlists about like 180 beats per minute to try and run in time um, with that beat, which is quite a useful way of um, trying to get your cadence up. So you could consider looking into that. But for me, um, 180 just feels so impossibly wrong <laughs> that I just can't do it. Whereas 
if I'm really pushing myself, here's the timer, we'll finish up really soon. Um, but basically like around that sort of 165 to 175 um, mark seems to be about right for me. So that's not to say with cadence that you're running faster. So you're not, your pace is not going up, but it's, you're trying to go the same pace, but basically take more steps per, um, per minute. And that way you'll deload each of the steps and make them a bit more comfortable. So we'll, I'll have to leave it there for today, um, but we will be going into more micro loading um, strategies. And, and so part of that is gonna be looking at how different footwear affects how you're um, basically able to, um, how your foot's gonna be striking the ground as well. So we'll be going into um, more of that soon, but I've gotta get going, gonna go for a run. So hopefully that was helpful. And if you do have any specific questions about running technique, I will be giving more tips and information about that soon, um, but do let me know. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you check out the Step In Injury Prevention Facebook group um, where I'll be yeah, posting exercises and some of this running uh, technique resources. It's basically where you can also ask questions for topics to talk about on the podcast. And yeah, I'm doing all these uh, all this information for free, but uh, if you have gone out for a run today and some GST, consider sending it my way. I've got my Solana wallet address in the description. Um, but otherwise, happy running and I'll see you tomorrow.